um, thank you all for being here. And let me pray, and then we'll start. Okay? Father, in the midst of what's going on in this world, and chaos, and war, and division, and poverty, so many things, Lord, and, and yet here we sit in a warm, lighted building, and we have fellowship one another, and we have a church, actually many churches, and we just see the hand of grace that you have on each one of us, and we want to say thank you. Thank you for all that we have, Lord. Thank you for blessing us. Make us a blessing to others, too. I pray, Lord, for Israel. I ask that you would give peace to Jerusalem. You tell us to pray for them, and we lift them up right now and ask for peace. We pray for the United States, that you would give us great wisdom with what's going on. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me with your spirit and speak so that we would hear your words. And this is a very complex teaching tonight. I pray that you would make us smarter than we are, make us wiser than we are, Lord, and, and teach us what your word is saying. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Marlon and I thought about this one. It's like somebody doing a thousand piece puzzle and you've just got the pieces in and then a kid comes over and, and blows the whole board up. It, it's kind of like that. This has been really a challenge. So we are really praying and this is the hardest one. So if you walk out of here tonight and you understood it, you should just tell yourself, I knew I was a genius, and then, and then realize it's going to be easier after this. This is the hardest, and I'm glad we took the hardest at the very beginning, because it was hard for us too, and that's, and that's good for us. Can you have somebody on Zoom just give a thumbs up if they can hear okay? Um, Zoom folks, can you give a thumbs up if you can hear me? Do you see this, everything all right? Oh. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So... Just in case you didn't hear, let me start with the prerequisite one that I, I taught everybody. I could do this in about two minutes. We have the security from Second Peter that other people do not have, other religions have sacred books, but those books don't tell the end from the beginning. God claims this solely to himself. I know the end from the beginning, and this is the sure word of prophecy that we have as Christians, especially as we see the, the dawn coming, the Lord's uh, coming very close. This is, Daniel had a vision that there would be 70 weeks for his people. God said, for my people. The first 69 weeks already happened. In those weeks, there was one temple, then a second temple. Then there was the birth of Jesus. Then the crucifixion. Well, at the crucifixion, the veil was torn in two. So now the Jews don't have their lineage. They didn't have the daily sacrifice. It really, it just ended everything. You can think of it like this. God was on the phone with Israel, and then he put them on hold, and he picked up the church. And we are on the church. But someday he's going to pick up the phone back to Israel. He did not divorce them. There was no break. He still loves Israel. They're his people. We are his bride. Two different relationships. Okay, so at the ascension of Jesus, um, the gospel went to the Gentiles primarily at Pentecost. It went to the Gentiles, and we, we came into the church age. At AD 70, the temple was destroyed. That matters to us, because the Jews are determined to put up a third temple, okay? And that will come. They will, they will get their wish. Okay, so between the 69th week and the 70th week, it's like two mountaintops. There was a long valley in there that the prophets didn't necessarily see. But now we know that there's a 70th week coming. This is the 70th week of Daniel. When this comes, it'll be um, one week, which is seven days. This will be seven years. And right in the middle of the seven years, the Antichrist is going to cause abomination that makes desolation. He's going to go in and desecrate this temple. Somewhere in here... We are going to be raptured. Now, I believe in pre-trib rapture, but I do not believe in pre-trouble rapture. So when I hear people saying, oh, any day now, we're out of here. We shouldn't have been out of here last week. We will be out of here any... And then I think to myself, well, maybe and maybe not. Because we can be here clear up till the signing of the covenant. So what is that? That is the beginning of the seven-year tribulations, when the Antichrist signs the covenant. 
between now and when that happens, that's why I have this like this, we're going to see the beginnings of a one world government, which we see right now, globalist, religion, one world ruler, the World Economic Forum, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about climate change, depopulation, diminishing food supplies. These all are going to have to do with the white horse, the red horse, and the black horse, and pale horse from Revelation 6. So we're going to go over all of that. When are these horses running? I don't know. But a kind of people are saying we're hearing the hoof, hoof freaks right now because it's a crown to a conqueror, a red horse, which is open war, a black horse, which is famine. We can see famine. They're killing off all of our animals. So we can see famine could be on the horizon. And then the pale horse, which is death. So here's the seven years. But we will go over all of this in great detail. That's what we're doing. We're breaking this down. So this week, we're talking about Israel's prophetic wars, because they have a number of wars to fight. If you were here when, at, at the church or any of the other times that I talked to, I went over this which is all the wars. And you folks over there, I'm sorry you can't see it. But it's the Ishmaelites, um, Moab, Tyre, Philistines, Esau, uh, Lebanon, which is Gebal, the Hagarites, Syria, Assyria, which is Iraq, Egypt, um, Gog and Magog, which is Russia, and on down. Well, here is the first three wars, and that some people like Amir, Sephardi, and Zip Sephardi believe that we have already had these first three wars fulfilled Psalm 83. I don't happen to believe that. I, I kind of think um, these wars, are, we're still going to have Psalm 83. But these three wars happened at Psalm 83, and you can see how it has the dots here. So if you don't have this yet, come up afterwards and take a picture of it so it will be in your phone. But you can see this is October 7th. This is October 7th that happened. The dot here, that was, of course, the Philistines, Gaza. But here were other people that were involved, Jordan, South Lebanon, Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt. Okay? Now the next battle we don't know in sequence will be the Damascus, the burden for Damascus. But you see how this is totally different? Then we come down here, and this is Ezekiel 38. So they're interesting, they flip, you know, Psalm 83, Ezekiel 38. Those are the two major wars. The reason why Ezekiel 38 is so significant and why we keep watching for that, that is the one where God shows up, rains down hailstones, all this absolute disaster, and the Jews burn the weapons for seven years after this war. So it's a very significant war that people have put into the tribulation. They have said, we're not going to be around for this war. So I don't know who was there when I was saying this. I almost decided not to ever teach this again because I heard this different teaching on the internet, and I was like, oh my goodness, maybe we're not going to be gone for the Ezekiel 38 war. Maybe we're going to be here. So I thought, well, until I do a lot more research on it, I don't want to say anything about it. But I don't know that this is true. So I'm not preaching like this is true. Oh, I don't preach anyway. I'm not teaching that this is true. Okay, I'm saying this is on the internet. People are teaching this. This is a better for us to have it in this room where we can talk about it, we can think about it. Um, Jason has some uh, previous things on Thursday nights, but he will be back. And so thoughts that you have, questions that you have, you can write them in the margins. We'll have a Q&A too. But I want us to hear about this as a group so that we don't go, you know, hearing it on the internet and, and have no one to talk to. This way we, at least we can talk about it. Now we want to stay right in the middle between um, truth and, you know, we always want to know the truth. But between, we don't want to get down into uh, conspiracy theories. You know, we want to stay, but we don't also want to say, this is what my pastor taught me 50 years ago, and that's it. We don't want to be too stuck in these two ways. We want to stay right in the middle. We want to stay open-minded, because what if there is something new that we didn't get? The best example is Tim LaHaye, when he wrote The Left Behind. His story is they're flying through an airport and the pilot leaves. And it sounds like life is just going on normal. Well, Tim LaHaye couldn't see forward to COVID. He didn't understand that we are going to be locked up and we're going to have a lot of things happen to us. So in his scenario, we were just out of here. I think we need to change that scenario and think differently about it. And this sort of helps you to think that way. 
Okay, and then Jesus commanded us to watch so we're doing the right thing. I'm going to read the blessing. It's um, Revelation 1-3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keeps those things that are written in it for the time is near. Okay, so if you can turn there, uh, go to Jeremiah 12. Jeremiah 12, and it's verses 14 through 17. <coughs> and they have this as the Mideast peace plan. The Mideast peace plan that God had. And you'll understand here in a minute. Thus says the Lord, against all my evil neighbors who touch the inheritance which I have caused my people Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them out of their land, pluck them out of the house of Judah from among them. Then it shall be after I have plucked them out that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. And it shall be if they will learn carefully the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, as they taught my people to swear to Baal, then they shall be established in the midst of my people. But if they do not obey, I will utterly pluck them up and destroy that nation, says the Lord. So God's peace plan was, I'm going to return everybody to their own nations. But my only thing I request you, because all these nations were scattered in all different directions, the only thing he requested is that they learn to swear by him. But they swore by Baal or Baal, but then now who is it they all swear by? Allah, <laughs> right? There's a lot of, of Islam took over. So God said, I'll give you each of your lands, but I want you to follow my people. So here's the peace plan. Um, here's the dates. You have it in your notes there. In 1919 was Afghanistan. In 2020, I'm sorry, 1922 was Egypt. In 1932, Saudi Arabia and Iraq. 1935, Iran, which is Persia. 1943, Lebanon. 1946, Syria and Jordan. 1948 was Israel. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bell Bellflower Declaration. If they had, if they had followed that, that was British. If they had followed that, they would have given Israel to the Jews in 1917. It would have prevented the Holocaust. But they didn't, and we know we lost all those people, six million Jews. Okay, and then it placed, they placed Israel inside Palestine, Palestine. Though it was Israel's ancient land, it was called Palestine, and that was sort of a, um, a thing that was done against Israel to name it Palestine. So can you put up the first slide? The first slide is the um, Abraham. Abraham descendants. I think we can see that. So if you look here, hopefully I can see this. Back to the last one. There you go. So Abraham was a busy guy. <laughs> you don't think about all that. But his wife Sarah, he had Esau and Jacob. Then through Hagar, he had all of these sons. Then through Keturah, Keturah actually was Egyptian. He had all, whoops, can't see. Okay, then Keturah. He had all these sons. Now, if you look through Jackson, you see Sheba and Dedan, which is Saudi Arabia. Now, we hear about Saudi Arabia in the uh, Ezekiel 83, 38, sorry. And then Midian, he had those sons, which are the Bedouins. So here's the shocking thing. All of these people worshiped Yahweh. That's the only God they knew at the beginning as, son, as sons of Abraham. Then as they got further and further out, they had their own religions and their worship of Baal and the sacrifice of children and all of that. But it started out all in the same uh, playing field. But now God, um, God asked them to sw swear by him and not anybody else. But here's an interesting fact. Abraham was 500 to 612 BC. Sometime in there is when they think he was. Muhammad was 610 AD. Is that the age of uh, 40? He had this vision and he brought about Islam. So now we've got the whole world backwards because they're saying that's Palestinian land. I've seen people carrying signs that say uh, Jesus was Palestinian. We've got this whole thing crazy. It's actually, no, it was Israel's land way, way, way before there was ever even the thought about Allah. So they certainly have not kept their, um, kept their what God asked them to do. Okay, but in Jeremiah 12, he said, I'm going to pluck you up and I'm going to destroy you. But he also plucked up and put the Jews back in their land. 
And that's happening now. Ever since October 7, people are going back to Israel. And personally, I think the safest place on earth is probably Jerusalem. If we could all move there, that'd be great, but I could be wrong. I think Jerusalem's pretty safe that God's going to guard it. Um, so he called them out of the Persian lands, too, and you know the Ottoman Empire um, collapsed after 400 years. So here's how the conflict went, if you're looking at that. Sarah and Hagar, the sons, had conflict. Then Ishmael and Isaac, were the, I'm sorry, the wives, the mothers, Sarah and Hagar. Then the sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Then the grandsons, Esau and Jacob. Then the cousins, Moab, Ammon, Jordan, and Hebrews. Then the grandson, Amalek, against the Jews. And they made it uh, the Jew-hating, violent religion of Islam. This is what Islam believes, and we'll get into this more next week when we talk about religions. They believe that Jacob stole the blessing, which we know from the Bible. But the blessing, actually, the better blessing, they say, went to Esau. And then Jake, then Israel came in and stole the land from them. So they, they've got the whole thing. They're the favored son. They are, that's their land. The blessing went to, to them. So they've got this, this very hatred of Israel because of that. And I, I can understand because Jacob usurped Esau. There was deception that went on there. Okay. So these are, who are these evil neighbors? And I'll read to you if you want to go to Psalm 83. Psalm 83. <coughs> Do not keep, I'll try it verse 1. Do not keep silence, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. And those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people. They have consulted together against your sheltered one. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia and the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined them. They have helped the children of Lot. Now you can see why people think that was the war for independence, because those are the same people. We come back over here. These are the same people, okay? But this teaching tonight is different. This is saying, what if that was not the fulfillment of Psalm 83? What if this is? Okay, so what if Israel, the idea, Israel Defense Force, is going to fight all these people? So Israel Defense Force versus Hamas, and we couldn't possibly read all these verses because we would be here till tomorrow. But if you come up and take a picture, you can go and double check this. So IDF versus Hamas, IDF versus the Palestinians. And if you go down here to Obadiah 1-7, that's a confederacy to keep them out the border. Do you know the Bible said that nobody will take the Palestinians in? Way back thousands of years. The Bible prophesied nobody will take you in. They will have a conspiracy against you, and they will not let you be in, ever. So if you want to go back and look that up, it was, a, it was predicted and prophesied by God that nobody's going to let the Palestinians in. And they, can't, they cannot get into the borders of Egypt or Jordan. Nobody wants them. I'm going to keep going. Okay. Is so, that the order? No, God? we don't know the order. Okay. So I do know this has started. Syria is where Damascus is. I do know this has started on some lower level because the airport at Damascus is where uh, Iran is running everything through. Mm -hmm. So I know this battle has started on some level. Um, Hezbollah, this battle has started. This is Lebanon. And this battle has started. Yibal is Lebanon. So when you look this up, there it is. The IDF versus Egypt. This is where it gets a little bit, a little bit different, because you see I have Jordan, Southwest Jordan, and Egypt. The reason I have all three of those as one title is if we go to Ryan, can you go to the map? Yes, That's okay. There it is. So. That one, not that, that one, the one before that, not the one with the arrows, the one before it. There you go. Um, see where Egypt is right there, and, and then Lebanon, you can see those two. The, um, the Edomites, here they are, the Edomites. They were part of ancient Egypt, part of southwest Jordan, and part of Jordan. So that's why you have to keep, when the Bible just names Edomites, 
You have to look, where are they today? They're filling that whole section. So I don't know for sure if there's going to be a war between Egypt and Israel. I don't know that. It's between the Edomites. So maybe it's going to be between um, Jordan. You know, Jordan's pretty mad. During this first October 7, they were out in favor of the um, Hamas. So I don't know what's going to happen there, but these three are tied. These three are tied because it's an ancient land there. Saudi Arabia, I don't see it. The person that I watch, his name is Bill Salas, and he was with Jimmy Evans. That's where this teaching came from. He has Saudi Arabia. When we read this verse, it didn't seem very strong to us. So I don't, I don't know if I see Saudi Arabia. Okay, and here's another question: it Was Iran? Okay, we know Iran is the puppet master behind all of this. And by the way, I don't know if you heard, but they took a, um, a ship today of ours in the Red Sea, an oil tanker. So and, uh, China, Britain and the United States bombed Iran right as we came. Britain and the United States bombed Iran while she was walking in. So oh, my husband says no. What? We're not going to be able to keep up with all the news, but talk about yeah, Iran for yeah, a second. Yeah. <clears throat> The big battle with Iran could happen before Isaiah 17. My husband's going to get up and talk about Isaiah 17. But we know they're not wiped out. How do we know that? They're in the list of Gog, Magog, the list that comes down from the north with Russia. So Israel, um, this, this we were taught this forever, that they're building a nuclear weapon, and Israel is going to have to preemptively strike them to get rid of that nuclear weapon. But it turns out that's not necessarily true because Elam, God breaks the bow and they cannot launch. So if you look back up here at this um, map, you see where Iran has a little bit of the seaport, right? They have a little bit of a seaport. That's where their, um, I can't really see my eyes, I'm not good enough. That's where their um, missile silos are. And just for interest, they say we can get to Israel in 400 seconds, which is 6.66 minutes. So they, they know exactly what they're doing. They, they know exactly what they're doing. So Iran may be taken care of by God. So just let me show you one thing, and then I'll move on to another topic here. But Turn to uh, Jeremiah 49. Here's something very interesting. You can turn to Jeremiah 49, and if you have a Bible that has headings. If you have a Bible that has headings, that Jeremiah 49, and just start turning. You'll see the first one, Judgment on Ammon. Judgment on Edom. You see all these battles? Judgment on Damascus. Judgment on Peter and Hazor. Judgment on Elam, which is Iran. And you can read that at some point and see that, that God might just take care of that. Israel might not have to. Um, chapter 50, judgment on Babylon and Babylonia. And so this is interesting that we, uh, we never really, st I never studied this, didn't realize that these battles are all actually listed right there. So I don't know if I've missed anything. I'll just say one more thing here and I'll turn it to Marlon. Amalek. So Esau, here's Esau as the father. Esau had the Edomites and he had Amalek, which were the Amalekites, right? So what happened to these people? Where did they go? Well, um, one of his grandsons was Amalek, who became the father of the Amal Amalekites. Some rabbinical schools in Israel teach that the Palestinian Arabs, the most fervent adversaries of modern Israel, are the Amalekites. So if you've studied Old Testament, you hear that, that they were always fighting the Amalekites. That that's who they are. Um, so remember the battle? Remember the battle that Moses was out on the mountain, and it was Joshua and the Amalekites? And as long as Moses kept his arm up, they won the battle. When his arm came down, they lost the battle. And God promised right there, it's in, if you want to write it down, Exodus 17, 15, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So that's why it's important for us to know where they are. So some of them are in northern Syria, the well-watered land of Edom, it's called. Nebuchadnezzar carried some of them um, to Mount, from Mount Seir to Babylon. And there's a city in Iraq called Basra, which is exactly the same as the Edomite city of Basra. <laughs> One letter difference. Um, they're, the likely Edomites are scattered throughout the whole Middle East. The, the chief uh, of the tribe of Edom was Teman, and that was uh, Esau's eldest son. 
So they are all over. There's even evidence that they settled in Italy. So that they, there's Edomites in southern Italy. So you can see that um, the birth rate for, let's say, the Western, the Western world, us in Europe, our birth rate is 1.2, 1 1.1, sometimes 1.3, how many children we have. The birth rate, this is in 2008, I had a video on it. The birth rate in 2008 for Muslims was eight children. So you can see that over time, this was, this was a losing battle. Well, we were all being told, don't have kids, we're gonna overpopulate the world. They were having children and children and children. So we are, we are strongly outnumbered, as are the Jews. So you know that there are three kids that came out of, um, out of the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Shem is the father of the Israelites, the Jews. Ham is the, is the father of um, the Egyptians and the African American folks, or just African folks. Um, and then Japheth, they went and settled in the Caucasus Mountains, that's why you get the name Caucasian. The largest used to be Japheth, but because um, a lot of the sons of um, the sons of Keturah, she was Egyptian, and then they married Egyptian. So you have a lot of um, the, the children that are Islamic are, are not, they're having multiple children, while the other people are not. So it's really getting out of balance, all that to say. Okay, so the ancient conflict that began with Sarah and Hagar has gone all the way through. It's coming down to us. All of this all of this causes peace. It causes a fake peace. They beat all of their neighbors, and it causes a fake peace that sets the, the stage for Ezekiel 38. Okay, Marlon will take it from here. Okay, so we'll, we'll shift gears just a little bit here. Um, take a look next at Isaiah 17 and the burden against Damascus. Um, a question we need to ask, or some questions we need to ask about Damascus is why is it so important? What matters? Okay, so a few facts about Damascus. Um, it is the capital of Syria, so it has political significance there. It is considered the fourth most holy city for Islam, so it has religious or spiritual significance in the Middle East. It is the oldest continuously inhabited city from the time of Abraham, okay, so it has historical significance. And then, currently, it is a hub for arms flow from Iran. So I, I, I coined this here. I said, you might say that Damascus is the Amazon of the Middle East. I'm mean, sorry, that, that Iran is the uh, Amazon of the Middle East, and Damascus is one of the, the distribution centers uh, to send these arms out to wherever uh, they're being asked for. So it has military significance. Um, and then now, and we'll find out, we'll see in um, Isaiah 17, that it has prophetic significance in that the prophecy here uh, tells us that it will, become, uh, will cease to be a city and it will be no more. So that's the prophecy against Damascus. Now some things about Damascus uh, in the verses 4 through 13, um, you know, Israel mm -hmm. doesn't go unscathed in this whole thing. So in those verses you'll see, uh, I'm not going to read them all, but you'll, you'll see some description of what happens for Israel. It talks about the the lean crops that they, they have during that time or after that time when their harvest is just waning, their, their strength is waning. So they, they, they take a hit of some sort. It's unclear exactly what it is, but it clearly says about the leanness of the harvest, the grapes, um, the olives, and the, and the grains. Um, so I want to read uh, one verse that's of significance regarding Damascus, and that is actually the last verse of Isaiah 17. And that verse says, Then behold, at eventide trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. So, total destruction overnight. Okay, something that's never happened before. Now, there have been invasions or conquering of Damascus in the past. Um, in 605 BC, it's mentioned in Amos, how Nebuchadnezzar went in and conquered Damascus. And uh, then Alexander the Great conquered Damascus in 323 B.C. So, you know, it, it, it was a conquer, it wasn't a destruction. So when you go in to conquer something, you want to take control of it. You want to inhabit it. 
know, you want to just overcome that per that place. So um, the prophecy was not fulfilled by Alexander the Great or Nebuchadnezzar. Neither teaching uh, of those two events talk about how Damascus was destroyed, let alone destroyed overnight. So that's that's the key point that it's um, is overnight. At evening time, there's trouble, and then before morning, it is no more. All right, so that's something to, to keep in mind. And, and um, Israel has attacked Damascus. Lorraine mentioned this earlier. Has to attack the airport in Damascus because of its its uh, significance for trafficking arms. Okay, but never have it as they attack Damascus to destroy it as is prophesied here. So um, it, the one implication of this is possibly that the uh, IDF, in case you don't know, IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, they maybe use some humongous missile strike overnight or perhaps a controlled nuclear attack of some kind. I don't know. I don't think anybody does. All we know is that it's no more overnight. Okay, so basically that's what the prophecy against Damascus talks about. They are, they haven't been destroyed yet, they will be overnight, and that's it. That's what God says, we believe it. Um, and yet it hasn't happened yet, it's still yet to come. So I want to skip then out of this prophecy and move to Ezekiel 38. There's, there's quite a bit of details in Ezekiel 38 uh, regarding that prophecy. And at first I had considered reading the entire chapter, but there's too much there. So I'm going to highlight some parts, but I want to encourage you for both of these, Isaiah 17 and Ezekiel 38, to go back and read the entire thing yourself. But we'll touch on the, the specifics of each of this in an abbreviated form here tonight. All right, so Ezekiel 38. So I'm going to refer over here um, to this chart. I'll try and stay out of the way so anybody who can be able to see it. Um, Lorraine was talking about this upper half uh, and the nations involved in here. Their biblical names and the current names of these nations. Ezekiel 38, <coughs> we're going to be referring to the countries from here down. All of these, their biblical names and their current names. Some of them are the same. Right, so if you were looking at Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 4, focus on the name of Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal, all references to Russia. It is widely believed and no argument against that being the case. It's been the whole verses 1 through 4 talking about that. So it establishes that Russia will be involved in this. I'm going to probably refer to them as Gog, just to use the biblical terms. Then if we look at verses 5 and 6, it talks about the other four nations that are involved in uh, this Ezekiel 38 prophecy. Iran, which is Persia, okay? Ethiopia, which is Ethiopia, Libya, and Turkey, which is Gomar and uh, Tagarma. Okay, so those nations are going to join together in the Ezekiel 38 prophecy to attack Israel and wreak havoc on them. Right? There are some prerequisites that have to take place, that have to be in place for this to happen. All right? And I'm going to switch back over now to this chart, prerequisites for Ezekiel 38. Now if we look at this, and I don't know if you can see it, but we'll, we'll, I'll read them to you. We gather to the nations, the Jews were or we gather from the nations. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. We see that happening already. They're coming back to their homeland. Check. And okay, that was done, or being done in the latter days, and I think we can all agree that we are in the latter days. So check, prerequisite met. Brought back from the sword, you know, some type of persecution maybe, or the Holocaust. I would say yes, check. Land in Israel had long been desolate. Well, yes it was. It was left barren for however long before the, the Israelis or Israelites came in and started making it a productive nation again. And by the way, the, the, the science or the, the the reasons how they were able to do that was just planting trees. It changed the whole ecology of the, the area, so they started being able to become productive. So check, we can take that one off. Now we come to these three over here, peaceful people. Well, I would say is the, the, the Israelis try to be a peaceful people, but they can't. They can't be now because they're under attack all the time. So we can't re re check that one off as being met. Land of unwalled villages, uh, secure without walls, bars, and gates. That's not the case. Um, just for interest's sake here, let me see what these numbers are again. Israel is the most fenced and fortified nation in the world. They have 403 miles of walls and fences, and uh, the, those walls include the border of, Je of Lebanon, where Hezbollah has actually made tunnels underneath that wall. Uh, walls at Gaza, we know about that. 
walls at Sinai into Egypt, and then walls at Jordan to stop the weapon transports. So they're not unwalled villages. Okay, then we have, then we have here also they have booty uh, and gold, which you know refers to some money, some kind of financial strength um, for that. And what you know, what question might be, what, where's the gold coming from? Well, who knows where Solomon's gold is? Maybe that's what they're talking about. I don't know. Just you know, <coughs> putting out some thoughts here. But there is something of value that that uh, the prophecy talks about for these nations to come down and attack Israel. Okay. Um, Ryan, can you bring up the slide of the, uh, the map again with the arrows? That would be the next slide. Now, it talks about these nations that are going to be attacking Israel, and primarily from the north. And who is up north? We have Russia and Turkey. Okay, those are two of those listed in our work chart of um, Ezekiel 38. And then there's also the ones that join from the east and the west and the south. Libya, which is just listed there, I couldn't get it into the map. Iran, and all the way down from Ethiopia. These are the other nations that come and join Russia. Now, it's interesting when you read through this chapter that it lists Russia first. And then throughout the chapter, it talks about those who come with you. So it seems evident to me that Russia is leading the charge, and then the other nations join uh, them in whatever's happening. Okay. Um, first few verses. So 38, starting at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Those are all referring to Russia and the far north. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O God, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, remember that, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed and great company with bucklers, and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his troops, the house of Zagarma from the far north, and all his troops, many people are with you. All right, so the with you statement may be, makes me believe that Russia is the one leading this. Um, and why are they doing this? Why are they attacking Israel? Well, it says in here, to gather plunder and booty. Okay. Plunder referring to their their uh, strength in, in their perhaps their agricultural gains, their livestock and animals and the things that are valued that way. But the booty is talking about monetary, uh, and it specifically mentions gold uh, and silver. So <coughs> they're coming down to take control of that. Now, an interesting thing is that in this in this um, battle, Israel really does nothing. And can do anything. Maybe they, they've depleted their military strength on all fighting all these other battles. I don't know, but they don't need to do anything because God does it. God takes care of it for them. And um, Ezekiel thirty-eight nineteen to twenty-two. Let's take a look at that, and I, I want to read that um, just very quickly. Nineteen to twenty-two. It says, it says there, For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the flesh of the sea, fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake in my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against God throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstone, fire, and brimstone. So that pretty much is a depiction, a depiction or a description of how God is going to do this. And not all those things that are listed, uh, this is the setting of precedent that have been used before. You know, the flooding rain, well, of course, we talk about the, you know, the great flood, you know, and, and the ark. Although God made a covenant and a promise not to ever destroy the earth again with a flood, he's not destroying the earth here. He's destroying these armies. So he's not breaking his covenant with that. Uh, the great hailstones, okay, same hailstones in Joshua 10 with the battle against, uh, against uh, Gibeon, in Gibeon. Um, hailstone was used to destroy the enemy there. 
And then fire and brimstone, of course, we know the story of Sodom and how that was destroyed with fire and brimstone. So if this isn't something new to have happened or to be happening, um, but it's certainly great power and great strength. Um, so the, pre, uh, the things that have to happen or that will happen, why don't you can bring up the next slide on that, um, talking about these things that show what is going to happen in that attack, okay? They'll cause an earthquake. Call for the sword, brother against brother. That means they're going to be infighting. They're going to be you know, battling each other. Bring judgment through pestilence and bloodshed. Right? There's just going to be judgment on them, and, and there's another way to do it. Flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Those are all things that uh, we just talked about in our mission in those verses. Okay? Um, so, once this is done, Ezekiel 38 prophecy is over. Okay? At least what it's saying. God has wiped out the enemy. What happens next? What happens post Ezekiel 38? 39. Ezekiel 39. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But what are the people of Israel going to be doing in Ezekiel 39? So let's take a look at that. Um, Ezekiel 39, verses 1 through 8. I'm not going to read that, but when you read it, you'll see that that is just a kind of a repeat of what was said in Ezekiel 38 about what's going to happen to God and the nations. Okay, as if they didn't get it the first time. He had, God has to remind them in Ezekiel 39 that that's what's going to happen to them. But if we look on to Ezekiel 39, verses 9 through 16, okay, I'm going to read that to you. Starting at verse 9. Then those who dwell in the cities of Israel will go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the javelins and spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. They will not take wood from the field or cut down any form of forest because they will make fires with the weapons and they will plunder those who plunder them and pillage those who pillage them, says the Lord God. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place there in Israel. In Israel, The valley of those who pass by east of the sea and it will obstruct travelers because they, there they will bury Gog and all his multitude. Therefore, they will call it the valley of Ham and Gog. For seven months, the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying, and they will gain renown for it on the day that I am glorified, says the Lord God. They will set apart men regularly employed with the help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. At the end of seven months, they will make a search. The search party will pass through the land, and when anyone sees a man's bones, he shall set up a marker by it until the barriers have buried it in the valley of Hammon God. The name of the city will also be Hamona, thus they shall cleanse the land. All right, so the, you see a lot of activity happening there. For seven years, they're going to have all these weapons from the, the Ezekiel 38 prophecy that's been just taking place, and they're going to burn them. It's, it, that's a lot of weapons to have to burn for seven years. Okay, and they're not taking anything out of the forest to do it. The weapons are, are the fuel for the fire. Um, and then you also see that that after, or you know, at seven, for seven months, they're going to be burying the bodies, the people that were killed during that Ezekiel 38 prophecy war. Um, seven months, they will bury them. And actually, it's seven plus, because after the first seven months, they're going to send out a search party, and they'll be staking some more bones and bodies and that sort of thing. Uh, to bury them. So it's, it's actually seven plus months. Now, it, it, as you read on, and I'm going to read it because it really is quite a uh, strange and grotesque description of what happens in there where, you know, the scavenger animals are coming in and feasting on the bodies. So, you know, a very specific description of what is happening after Ezekiel 38. All right? Um, so kind of a summary then of, of Ezekiel 38 Take a look here. What's happening? Burning weapons. I mean, Ezekiel 38. Yeah, Ezekiel. Uh, burning weapons for seven years. Lots of weapons to burn. Burying bodies for seven plus months. Okay, they're doing that to cleanse the land. Remember, the, we, you don't know what caused all of this. Well, we do know what caused all of it, but what is the result of these bodies? If you got fire and brimstone, is there some contamination going on? Maybe they're out there in the map suits. You know, who knows? But they're cleansing the land. And then all the nations will know that I am the Lord. He says that several times. You will know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. I will, thus saith the Lord. And he's going to do it. One of the greatest things about all this is that 
God's power and magnificence is on display. He will do what he says he will do. And so I think we can camp on that and count on that. And, and anything that we see and read about what God says he will do, we have that promise he will do it. Okay? All right? Okay, so all this just was the tennis set. Okay? Now we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of what does this mean? So what does this mean? Well, it means something different than what we thought. So hang on to your hats, because here we go. So uh, Zechariah 12, 1 to 9, talks about the cup of trembling. If you can get to that, Zechariah is almost to the end of the, of the Old Testament. <clears throat> okay, and it's verses 1 through 9. It said, The burden of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth, and, let's see, my eyes are going bad, so you'll see me. Soon they're going to be corrected, but you'll see me like this. <laughs> okay. I'll make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the people. All who would eat their way will surely be cut into pieces. Though all nations of the earth are gathered against it, in that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah, and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves, they shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in its own place. Okay, so why is all this important? It's because Israel has two moments of peace, but they're both kind of false, okay? They fight all these enemies, and it brings about a peace, right? That peace sets up unwalled villages, this sort of a peaceful feeling that they have, unwalled villages, and then, bam, comes Ezekiel 38. Uh, he puts a hook in there in the jaw of Russia, which we, we can't help but think it's Putin because he's been around forever. You kind of feel like he's going to be here forever, but maybe not. But they're going to put a hook in their jaw and bring him down to Jerusalem or down to Israel. And we wonder if it's Solomon's gold, if there's going to be some great thing that's discovered. And Russia's economy is kind of dying. Maybe this is the hook that's in the jaw. They come from all these other nations, so they get this sort of peace from this. They think they've got a peace, then they have Ezekiel 38, and then they have another peace that they think they're going to have when they make the covenant with the Antichrist. So they think they're entering into peace. Okay, so here's what I want you to really put on your hats here. The third temple is not sanctioned by God. This temple that they're all working on right now is not God's temple. It's not something that he's calling for at all. It's the Antichrist's temple. And the Antichrist is alive and well. I don't know who he is, but we are going to talk at length about him in one of the weeks. We're going to give you some clues to who he is, but we're not going to say who he is because we don't know. But we do have some clues, okay? That he's a, he's a man, he's not a woman, he's not AI. You know, people are saying AI is the Antichrist. No, he's, he, he's going to be an actual person. He will have a, a, some sort of a Jewish pedigree because they rejected Jesus Christ and he had the long line from Mary and Joseph. They're going to look for that Messiah. But Jesus didn't create an earthly kingdom. This man will create an earthly kingdom. So all that to say, he's here and he wants this temple. He wants this temple because he's going to go inside there and declare himself to be God at the <coughs> midterm of the, um, of the tribulation. Okay, so here's the question. Here's the $6 million question. Run with me for a second. I'll put this down so you folks can see this over here. Now, I'm not saying this is accurate. I'm saying put on your thinking hats, okay? Here we go. My husband made me this. Three and a half years, right? Three and a half years and three and a half years of the tribulation equals seven years. My husband just told you after Ezekiel 38, there's seven years of burning of the weapon. The first half of the tribulation, the IDF is not doing anything. They're so, they're so calm. They've made this covenant. They're so completely calm. They don't even prevent the Antichrist from going in and desecrating the temple. 
They have unwalled villages, they're happy, they're at peace, okay? But they are burning the weapons, supposedly, for seven years. So if Ezekiel 38 happens here, you've got to have these seven years of burning the weapons. That puts you to the second coming of Christ. The problem is, at the midterm, when the Antichrist desecrates the temple, everybody's fleeing for their lives. The Bible says that two-thirds of the Israelites are slaughtered. One-third flees to Petra. The one-third the one third that go to Petra um, are the ones that will eventually say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord at the second coming, when it says Israel will be saved. That's the one-third, and I'll read the verses in a minute. But I want us to start grappling with this. If that's the seven years, they're not going to be burning weapons while they're running for their lives. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. What if Ezekiel 38 is going to happen? And it's going to happen soon. Then we would have, not, not setting dates, but we would have at least three and a half years here to be burning these weapons. So why does that matter? Why does that matter? It goes back to the original ideas that we have all adopted that on a Sunday afternoon after potluck, we're out of here. And I'm saying, I'm not so much thinking that is going to happen. Because I'm thinking that these wars have been a thread that has been pulled, and that thing is going to continue to unravel, okay? So we are here today. You are here. You go to the mall. Where's the restroom? You are here. We are here. This is going to be battle after battle after battle happening. Then Israel will subdue its neighbors and it will enter into a little bit of a season of peace, right? Because they've, they've gotten rid of everybody. I think then Ezekiel 38 is going to happen. There's going to be some massive war here that, that kind of is not what we're all expecting. And, that, and that's okay. If it is happening, great. If it's not happening, great. The only evidence that we have that it could be happening is because of those seven years. Those seven years of burning weapons. Where are the seven years? It's possible that, you know, they keep burning them all the way through here, and the Ezekiel 38 battle happens after we are raptured. But I want to get us in our mind that it might not happen after we're raptured. So what does this do with the, with the theology of eminence, the doctrine of eminence? We've been taught... And it's true, I'm not getting rid of the doctrine of em eminence, but we've been taught that nothing except for 1948, when Israel became a nation, has to happen until the rapture could happen at any moment. But just to think for a minute, what if, what if no? What if we're going to go through a lot more? And what if we're ill-prepared for that? Because we keep thinking we're out of here. So just for you know five minutes, let's think about what if we're just not out of here? What if we are going to go through trouble, not tribulation, not tribulation. We are not in the tribulation until the Antichrist signs a covenant. So, Revelation 6, right? Revelation 6, these are the horses. You're not in the tribulation necessarily. Now, some theologians will put the horses in here. But it's possible the white horse is already running. It's possible somebody did get a crown on May 6th. It's possible that a white horse is running. It's possible that we're going into open war. It's possible that famine is coming. It's possible that death is coming and we have left. Okay, not, I'm not post-trib, I'm pre-trib. But I just feel this burden to say we need to get ready because in Matthew 25 there were the wise virgins and the foolish virgins the wise virgins had oil in their lamp and it got dark and everybody fell asleep and then only the ones with the oil in the lamp woke up and were ready so my greatest thing is that we are to watch and we are to get ready because our lives are <coughs> not like I kept saying after COVID what was it 15 days to stop the cure or uh, stop the curve. Remember that? Flatten the curve. Flatten the curve. Yeah. That's it. You know. Well, we have never gone back. We have never gone back to that. Um, so I really think that 
I, I mean, I'm going off my notes now. I'm not on my notes. I just want to say it's possible, folks, that we're here longer than we want to be, that we wanted to be out a long time ago. I was listening to a man talk about this and saying, you know, he was a Jewish man, and he was saying to my Christian brothers and sisters, if you heard what was going on before the Holocaust, and you heard that people took Jews into their homes and hid them, it may be your turn to do that. That could be coming our way. That whatever Jesus said, whatever you've done to the least of these my brethren, you've done to me. Those are his brethren. So I don't know. I don't want to be the bearer of bad tidings because I'm a really happy, upbeat person. <laughs> but I do feel like saying to the church, we might need to wake up. It might not be exactly how we think that we're just waiting for any moment to get out of here. It could be war upon war, upon famine, upon um, the World Economic Forum trying to take away all of our freedom. We could live through some of this. <clears throat> and the answer to all that is, um, is, I, is uh, Psalm 91. It's Psalm 91. He that dwells in the secret place shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It's getting to know God like this. So that you know when he says, go here, do this, do that, you hear that voice all the time. We have one week here that we're going to do spiritual and physical preparation because we do. We are not conspiracy, okay? We are not. So we're not going to say, run out in the middle of nowhere and get a bug out. And we're not. We're not. But it's just prudent anyway to have some food and water and be somewhat prepared. So now I'm going to open it up to questions. And um, I want you to know I am not teaching that this is true. This is from Bill Solis and Jimmy Evans. I want you to go look it up. I want you to listen to it. It's very complex. We try to break it down a little bit. But it is possible that these wars are going to happen before we go. Okay. That is my part. Now I'm going to take questions. Uh, that have evangelical focus and they want to share the gospel. In, the, in Romans, uh, Romans 11, 25, Apostle Paul says, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles. When we listen to IMB, there are millions of people, tribes around the world that we do not have the translation of the word yeah. in their, in their you know, dialect or language. So how are we seeing all of that? the fullness of Gentiles, right? The redemption of Israel, that's also part of this whole prophetic event, you know, environment. How do we see that? How many years do you think it's gonna take us to actually get the word to the Gentiles, then see the redemp redemption of, of Israel? That's a very good question. She asked, um, a lot of people don't have it in the, the Bible in their own dialect, and when did the times of the Gentiles end? In this way, the, the doctrine of eminence is absolutely true. When the that. last Gentile is saved, then, then we're out of here. Um, but uh, we can't know that. We can't know that. And there is revival breaking out in different places all over the country. I just read this morning, revival mm -hmm. is breaking out in Paris. So, um, you know, if we need to pray, we need to pray for that. Send revival, Lord. Help wake us up because um, it, the, the wide places we've all lived in are becoming narrower and narrower. And we can feel that, that, that all of our freedoms are starting to sink. We'll get into that a lot more in different weeks. When we get into Islam next week, and then the week after that is Antichrist. And the, not Islam. Next week is religion. So we're going over Islam, Wicca, Freemasonry. Christianity, Buddhism, all that, all the differences. But then Antichrist, and then we'll get into more of the spiritual and physical preparation. So yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. Another question. What is am? You keep saying eminence. I don't know what that is. Fine. How do you spell eminence? Eminence. 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 Oh. Eminence. I'm sorry. The eminent. That means the eminent or quickly coming return of Christ. It was a doctrine of eminence. It's taught here at this church. It's it's in almost every evangelical church. And it preaches what? And it teaches that, that the only thing that had to happen for Jesus to return was oh. Israel to be back in the land in 1948. And since then, the rapture could happen at any time. Absolutely true. We can in, be gone in imminent. 10 minutes. In imminent. Right. Eminent oh. versus imminent. Imminent. Oh, that's what I'm saying. I'm pronouncing yeah. it wrong. Imminent. Eminent. 
on my thing. I'm it's the imminence. I've been studying too much. much. It's the imminence of the rapture. Is yes. the rapture imminent? Imminent. That's a good doctrine. We have believed it. We should believe it. I'm just saying we could have more trouble ahead. Yes. Yeah, I've realized um, the pre-tribulation rapture is um, favorable to, to believers, right? I don't see how it's that um, unusual that the Christians aren't persecuted before, uh, like you're saying, and like the scripture mentions. And I've, I've studied before where the, you know, the, the tribulation, the first three and a half years is the Antichrist tribulation. And the second three and a half is God's tribulation. So, Absolutely. And there's a mid-tribulation and a pre-wrath and all that kind of stuff that I, I don't get caught up in all that, but I don't see why that is such a novel um, idea or concept. It, it, it's just it's going on right now. And so he's making the point there's Christian persecution all the time. Let me make one more thing and then I'll get the other hand. This uh, Holocaust and all the stuff that we're watching here, <coughs> this is man's inhumanity and anger and bitterness towards man, correct? And he, Dan made an excellent point. From this point on, it's God's anger against them. Well, just like in Ezekiel 38, he's going to hail down and he's going to cause all manner of trouble. The sky rolling back if you've read Revelation. A whole lot of stuff here. So, so Dan's making the point, people have always been, Christians have always been persecuted. And, um, you know, there are people who believe in pre-trib. There are people who believe in um, pre-wrath. That's somewhere after, uh, after Revelation 6. That's when we're going to go because Revelation 6, 16 is the first time the Bible says the word wrath. Revelation says the word wrath. You've already gone through all these horses. And then it says the word wrath. So I understand why people believe that. I personally believe in the pre-trip. I, <coughs> I think, I'm not, a, I'm not a theologian, I think we're going to be raptured. I'm just not pre-trouble. I think we're going to, we're seeing that since COVID, we are going to go through trouble. We are. Okay, yes. Yeah, I was just basically uh, piggybacking on what he was saying, what he basically... Can you speak a little I was basically piggybacking on what, I guess yeah, you said, Dan. Yeah. Uh, but then he wrapped it up at the end. I didn't know he was going to say what he said at the end. But basically, it's easy for us in this country to say that we're pre-trouble because we're not being persecuted. But if there's other countries as Christians, they are being persecuted. And so if we have a different perspective and viewpoint as we exactly. sit here in Prestonwood Baptist Church in America. But those people might weigh in a little differently mm -hmm. if you said we were, if someone tried to make the argument that it was pre trouble. Exactly. So I'm saying I'm not pre trouble. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. I those people would agree with you that are in another country. That's right, because they are living through trouble. Correct. Yes, as Christians, as believers, they're being for their faith they're because their of faith. their faith. I think it's is it Nigeria? They yes. just went in and slaughtered a bunch of Christians. Mm -hmm. Like we could be They've living in trouble. Yeah. We could be experiencing trouble here, but I don't think there's any Christians in numbers in America that are hiding out because they are Christians that are trying to survive simply because of their faith. In other countries. You're, you are persecuted for your faith, and that, that alone. And so that makes a difference in what our perspective here. Did you all hear that? He said that um, we are not being persecuted for our faith and going to hide because of our faith, whereas other countries are having to hide because of their faith. Yes, Dan. I, I mean, having said all that, the, of course, while we're here, is there is a buildup. There's persecution, then there's a buildup that you triangulate, or best you can tell what the series of events that occur and that's why we're trying to we have interest to see that um, and it's it does appear that uh, even though imminence means any time and the Lord tells us don't you know you, you won't know right um, it even says I believe that the Lord won't I mean they won't know it says so let's talk so, about that so that's what spicy. Jesus said, no, the no one knows the day or the hour. Remember he said that? Including my son in heaven. I, I wasn't going to know when we were going to put this in, so I'll put it in right here. In Jewish um, thinking, the festival that no one knows the day or the hour was the Feast of Trumpets, and no one did know the day or the hour. 
what they had to do, they knew the season, and we all agree that we can know the season, and we probably are in the season, okay? But the festival of no one knows the day or the hour, they would have to go out at night and keep watching and keep watching when they saw certain stars and everything line up like, um, then they would know, okay, the festival starts and they would blow the shofar. You would hear the trumpet, the feast of trumpets, and then you would know that this uh, festival has started. So when Jesus was saying that to the disciples, they would have known what that meant. Oh yeah, the feast that we don't know the day or the hour. Yes, we're going to stay right here with this because some people have taken that way out here and say Jesus will come on the Feast of Trumpets in 2024 or whatever. Okay, we don't go out there. I don't, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying yes, this, this no one knows the day or the hour would have been heard differently to a Jewish audience. They would have thought about that was, oh, that's this thing because we don't know the day or the hour and we celebrate it when the shofar is blown. So it's kind of interesting. I haven't done enough study to have an opinion on it. It's just interesting. But if we just take it at face value, we're not going to know. And I feel, I feel really bad for people who make these predictions because then it's always wrong. You know? yeah, and it's I'm, just always, always, always wrong. I would <laughs> say we have, to, we, have to avoid, we have to avoid the arrogance of thinking pre-trouble because I think that is arrogant to say, well, there's people in other countries who are being persecuted for Christ, but we're not going to be because we believe in pre-trouble. Which I just think is arrogant. No, we believe in pre-trib. No, but I'm saying but, that there are people that, that, oh, that associate pre-trib with pre-trouble. Pre That's right. And when you made the at the beginning and you said throughout that you're pre you're not pre-trouble. I, I think that is, and, and I'm not trying to, to to divide anyone, but I think that would be a little arrogant if somebody took the, the position of pre-trouble because there's plenty of people who are in trouble right now because of their Christian faith in other countries. I think that's true. Yes, did you have a comment? Well, I'm 72, and all my life, my, you know, I, I didn't believe I'd ever reach this age. You know, I thought Jesus was coming. And um, people always believed that, um, you know, Christians weren't going to suffer. We are just going to be living our lives, and everything was going to be hunky-dory. We're gone. If for no reason, <laughs> you know, there's nothing to answer to build up to it. You know what I'm saying? I do. And so a lot of people are still stuck in that because you know we didn't have all this stuff going on. So time. here's the part that feels unfair to me if I'm just being really honest. My grandparents got to be born, got to have their children, got to live their mm -hmm. whole lives, got to die lived in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and even to the 70s and 80s. They had this life and they raised kids and they went on. Uh, this is my uh, son-in-law, Ryan, who's doing our technical. Thank you, Ryan. So we've got seven grandkids, you know, we're looking at all this going on. It's not the same, right? But I think, I think it's very true to say to yourself, God chose me to be alive right now. I'm supposed to be alive right now. This is my time to be alive. And, and not feel like, why didn't I live when Nanny lived, you know? No. <laughs> but this is my time. God called me to be here. First point. Second point, you know, when a child is being born and you're having the contractions, there's this squeezing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're coming into this time of testing, and um, we're being tried and tested like gold and silver to be purified and to be righteous because when Jesus comes back, he's looking for a righteous church mm -hmm. and holy and blameless, which we get that from Jesus Christ, but also our lives uh, are being squeezed yeah. out. Like how I lived life pre-COVID is different than how I live life now. We should have a more seriousness about us and, you know, think about what do we want to do with our lives and who do we want to talk about and talk to and, and all that. So there's a seriousness. So I think it's important that we go through this. We've been called for this. We're all here because we're here. So who and much is given? Unless much there's going to be, unless now here's another thought to bring up. Well, I am way off my notes. I'm sorry. <laughs> here's another thought. This country, they're saying already, is it three million people have come in illegally just since you know our current president became president? Is it three million? Six, six. six million. Six million. Okay, there are terrorists that have come in. Mm -hmm. There are um, military age yeah. people uh, by the by a lot that have come in, and so life as we know it is narrowing down. You know, and so thinking about what's important and who we want to be in this time 
is really important for us because you wouldn't want to wake up one day and go, why didn't I contemplate this? <laughs> why didn't I think that this could happen? Because you have to grow spiritually and be prepared for what you're um, going to face. So a soldier gets prepared. You know, you, you, you run a race, you prepare to win the race. You know, that's, and that's what I guess I'm kind of saying is it's not just all going to be uh, potluck after church. <coughs> I'll take one or two, and I think we'll we'll wrap it up so we can visit a little before we have to go. I'll take as many as you have, actually. I'll, any other questions? <laughs> I was I yes. just going to say that <clears throat> walking and abiding in truth <clears throat> in today's times will lead to persecution. From cancel culture to corporate greed to everything else when the Christians stand up. You may lose your job. Yeah. You may lose this. You may lose that. God doesn't give us a pass on that. It's, I mean, I even see it in our industry. Standing firm on truth is not necessarily what people we do business with want. And it, I mean, it's happening. So he said standing for truth will bring persecution. It's already happening. There's no pass for that. You understand for what's right. So important that we meet together. That's why the Bible says do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together because you'll know each other. You look around the room, wherever you see each other, you know that, that we've all talked about this. We've all thought about it. We have each other, and that's a blessing. Anything else? Well, I just appreciate you referencing Psalm 91 because I think personally for me, and maybe maybe it's, this is just me, but you know, I can get caught up in, man, they got six million people coming across and there's some terrorists, and next thing you know, it's gonna be three years or four years before I've got terrorists and prosper. I mean, like you can get kind of crazy with this stuff. Um, or you can have some balance there and say, I understand what's going on. Things are shrinking in. I'm not gonna get too far in the weeds because now I'm taking my eyes off the Lord and Psalm 91. And I think really leaning in and pressing in to being uh, closer and getting to know God more intimately uh, will open up our eyes, as you said, and, um, about um, you know how we'll be prepared and hear from God. Because you know, you just reminded me what I was going to say is it looks like right now if we were in a plane, it looks like we're nosediving pretty pretty much, but it's always possible. It's always possible that this happens. So you know, it's always possible that we pull ourselves together and you know close up the border or whatever it is that needs to happen. It's possible that things can turn. So I don't want to lose hope. Oh, no, I, I'm not yeah. losing hope. I just think it's in the midst of all that, Psalm 91 is right. very powerful. We focus our eyes on Jesus. Yeah. And so by, doing that, the on the by doing that, we don't see the refugees as aliens, right? Um, as a as politically conservative person. My heart is goes out to these families and children that are coming this side. I agree. We could have home churches. We could be inviting them in for a meal. We could be doing a whole bunch of things to really show the love of Jesus and not make them go assimilate with those crazy loons <laughs> out there. Frankly, you know, we could we could stop the nonsense by being out there helping the refugees. So what she's saying, and and she's right, there are the innocent um, and good people who have just yeah. been fleeing to America. Um, I often think to myself, I would run here. So, you know, I, I, I get that. So she's saying we could be a help in that situation. It's a non-political thing. Just be helpful to people. I, I agree with that. Ryan? We have one question from online, yes. or on the Zoom. Uh, Johnny is asking uh, about how do we know that the Antichrist is alive? Okay, that's a good question. If if the plane is doing this and it U-turns and we go back to life as it was and we're doing well, then yes, it could be that, that the Antichrist isn't even born, right? But if the Antichrist is not even born, then you have to have nine months of pregnancy, toddler, <coughs> elementary school, junior high, high school. He's got to become an adult at least 30 years old. Are we saying we have 30 more years before he's going to show up? So that's, these are the tough questions you have to ask yourself. If you feel like we are kind of coming into the last days, if you do feel that, then you also have to acknowledge he's undoubtedly here. 
So that, that has to do with your own eschatology, your own study of end times. There are people who don't believe he's here. He's not even a twinkle in somebody's eyes. He's not even alive. But if you think, no, you know, we're right in here. We've got the one world order coming. Then you have to think, no, he's got to be waiting in the ring somewhere. He's somewhere here. We're going we're gonna to have fun that night, too, because I have a, we're going to do a chart like this. And we're going to have fun because i got everybody. Macron, Trudeau, Trump, Obama. You know, i got, I got all these people. We're going to have fun talking. About, could it be this person? Could it be that person? Because you're going to hear it on the inter internet. You might as well have fun here talking about who that is. Who is it? We don't know. I just think we're so close to the end. He's got to be alive. He's got to be walking around. That's just my view, you know. Well, so, what about the Muslims that believe uh, their guy it's already the, yeah, the 12th Imam, they, um, we'll talk about that next week in the Division of Religions. We'll talk about their eschatology. Okay, there's no more questions. I'm going to pray. <laughs> Let us go home. Okay, <laughs> let me pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for saying what you want to say, Lord, and help us to focus on you, not go too far to the left or to the right, Help us not to run to the hills and, and be afraid. And help us also not to be totally ignorant of what's happening. Help us, Lord, to be alive, awake. Our eyes are open. Our eyes are focused on you. We're putting oil in our lamps. We're ready for when you call us. Help us to be those people who are blessed for watching for you. Help us, Father. Help us. Help us to stay right. Help us to be in the secret place with you, Lord. I pray again that you would bless our country. Give us wisdom in this battle that's heating up in the Middle East. Give us great wisdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.